Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Before we introduce our speaker, a few words. And it's not about history today, but I just, just a few words, just a few comments. I was here Tuesday, November 8th. And as you know, uh, state and government organizations give, in the United States give uh, government employees the day off so they can go to the election and all that. And so this was ghost town in my office because all the staff was gone. I know the clinicians were here, but the staff was gone and so forth. But interestingly enough, I was here yesterday after the election. And even though everybody was here, it was also ghost town. It seemed to me that some who were very happy about the opportunities and some who were very sad, perhaps even angry about the change, were unwilling to address the issues. So everybody was talking to each other very medically and the patient, but it was like nobody's, everybody's trying to avoid confrontation because nobody knows how everybody votes, you know? It was sort of interesting to watch that change in a few days from the beginning of the week to where we are today. And <clears throat> I appreciate the fact that my people are trying to be appreciative of each other's sentiments in, in this time that has been such a crazy uh, election. But there are two comments I want to bring about that. Number one is that <clears throat> it is an incredible privilege to be born and to work, is in my case, in a place where a transition like this that has been so divisive can occur in the absence of a revolution. Syria does not have that opportunity. Iraq does not have that opportunity. China doesn't have that opportunity. So we got to be grateful of the fact that we're going to be moving on and that this is a good thing and that this allows us to get engaged in religion and the arts and in medicine and in healthcare and all these other issues without having to worry about survival day in and day out. Don't never forget that. The second thing that I want to make is that the situation in Kentucky has not changed. Despite this election, the situation in Kentucky has not changed. And I will remind you about what I've told you over the past few years, is that the health index of this state has not changed in 25 years. Count the elections and the number of medical centers and the number of medical schools and the number of health care providers and the number of medical students and nurses and other providers that we have in the state. And our health index is at the bottom of the list, and it hasn't changed for close to three decades. And that we remain at the top of the list for tobacco-related disorders and for lung cancer and other problems. And we'll talk about breast cancer today and many other things. So the objective and the mission and the vision and the work of this department has not changed a bit. And nothing about this election has changed your duties or my expectations and vice versa. There is no uncertainty here. I'm going to trademark that thing. There is no uncertainty in this building. We know what we're up to. We know what we do. And nothing has changed. We come in that direction. So with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Amanda Caricado, who's going to talk to you about low-dose cancer. And then after that, we'll bring Brett Riley up here, who's going to introduce our speaker of the day. Thank you so much. Um, so I will take just a few minutes of your time prior to the breast lecture to talk about lung cancer screening with low-dose CT. Um, I'm one of the radiologists here at University of Louisville, and I spend about half of my time, though, promoting screening services um, for the people here in our uh, healthcare network. So lung cancer screening with low-dose CT, why? For many years, you know, we looked for a screening exam for lung cancer because lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in the United States. And even with advanced treatments, the rates of uh, survival are very low because it's diagnosed at such a late stage. So it's, it's a killer cancer. Smoking is the number one risk factor for developing lung cancer and accounts for 80 to 90 percent of lung cancer diagnoses. So there's an estimated 94 million current or former smokers at risk in the United States for developing lung cancer. And approximately 7 million Americans meet eligibility criteria for low-dose CT. And here in Kentucky, it's especially important. Kentucky consistently ranks number one or number two in smoking, and Kentucky has a higher incidence of lung cancer than uh, the national average, 
and our rates of mortality are higher than the national average as well. We see very high pack years of smoking. People have been smoking since they were small children. So that brings us to, we needed a screening test. So the National Cancer Institute funded the National Lung, Cancer, Lung Screening Trial, the NLST, which ran from 2002 to 2007. And approximately 54,000 people were recruited um, to participate um, and to determine if screening with low dose CT could decrease the risk of death from lung cancer among a high risk population. And the participants were either um, assigned to the low dose CT group or a chest x-ray group. And they had a total of three annual screenings. And the results demonstrated a 20% reduction in mortality from lung cancer in the screening low dose CT group compared to the control chest x-ray group. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2011. So in December of 2013, the United States Preventive Services Task Force actually uh, classified lung cancer screening with low dose CT as a grade B and recommended annual low dose CT um, in high risk patients from ages 55 to 80. Um, CMS in February of 2015 actually said that it would be an added benefit for uh, Medicare patients. And so under the Affordable Care Act, uh, lung cancer screening with low-dose CT is free, no copay, no deductible, to most eligible insured patients with either commercial or government insurance. So most plans pay for this. Very few do not. So that's a free test, and it's the only test uh, shown to decrease the chance of dying from lung cancer. And to put it in perspective for other screening tests that we're very comfortable ordering, breast, as that's our breast lecture today, um, the reduction in death from lung cancer with screening low-dose CT is larger than the reduction in death from the target cancers of other common screening tests, mammogram, and breast cancer. So it's, it's as good or better. So what is it? It's a non-contrast CT of the chest. It's optimized to detect sub-centimeter pulmonary nodules at much lower doses of radiation than a traditional CT of the chest, so three to four times um, less radiation than a routine CT chest. Um, it's non-invasive. It's a single breath hold, so most people can do this. It takes under a minute to perform. We do report in lung rads, and that's to provide uniformity for our ordering clinicians. It's similar to bi rads, and it's a lexicon that's just very standard and tells the clinician that order exactly what the next step is. And then we also um, are tracking these patients in the ACR registry so that we can have our own report card on what we're doing with lung cancer screening. It's just important in screening. Um, so who's eligible? For Medicare, the patient ages are 55 to 77. Commercial insurance expands it to 55 to 80 to be reflective of the United States task force. They have to be asymptomatic of lung cancer. Um, they can have a cough, they can be short of breath, but they have to be at their baseline. They can't have anything new or changing um, that, that is suspicious for lung cancer. They must have at least a 30 pack year of smoking cigarettes, and they can be a current smoker or they can be a former smoker who has quit less than 15 years ago. So when you're filling out that order, the number there has to be under 15. And they cannot have had a CT chest um, in the last 12 months. So it's a free test. It decreases the risk of dying from lung cancer. Um, and it's non-invasive. But there is some red tape associated with it. Certainly, it's uh, very highly regulated. Uh, and so we have to do some of, the, some of the hoops to jump through to get this test for our patients. Patients with Medicare and Medicare replacement plans have to have what is called a shared decision-making and counseling visit prior to the initial baseline screening study. This is basically just a formal um, discussion with that patient regarding the risks, the benefits, the pluses, minuses of love lung cancer screening, and what could happen. Um, the good news is that it is reimbursed between $59 to $69 in the state of Kentucky, so you will get paid for it. And I put the codes there um, using the modifier if it's on a sick or well person visit versus the 2096 if you just brought them in just for tobacco um, cessation and shared decision making. Um, some resources to help your patients and to refer them. My favorite website is shouldiscreen.com, um, and it's, it's uh, a comprehensive online tutorial that's patient-friendly. It has a risk calculator. It takes less than two minutes, ten minutes to go through it. It's very helpful. The ACR has a bunch of information and links. If you just put in the search engine lung cancer screening, you'll have patient links, um, brochures you can uh, print off, uh, physician links. Uh, the, all the trials, basically all the information. Lung Cancer Alliance as well has uh, quite a bit of information. We have a patient brochure, and then we also are working on a provider toolkit to help make this easier for our providers. So our goal in lung cancer screening with low-dose CT is to diagnose lung cancer at an earlier stage when it's treatable to see that stage shift. So we have to recruit and retain our eligible patients. We have to encourage that multidisciplinary approach um, to lung cancer screening and treatment. And of course, lung cancer screening is good, but the best thing is to promote tobacco cessation and education. And I'm a radiologist, so it wouldn't be complete without at least one or two pictures. So this is a low-dose CT, and you can see, I put that large circle on there. That's a small 1.2 centimeter suspicious nodule. There's nothing else in the lungs. There's nothing else to be worried about. 
this person will likely go on their merry way after this is you know taken care of versus what we typically see coming into our ER, um, patients that are coming in symptomatic in the body imaging room. You know, certainly this is a much more um, ominous picture with you know, effusion, consolidation, mass, et cetera. And that's my cell phone number and my email if you have, this was the quick version, if you have any questions or anything I can do to help um, you with your patients or provide education tools and resources, we're happy to do that. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Amanda. That's really important. I hope to see the same vigor applied to lung cancer screening as we get in Tinktober for breast cancer awareness. So it's, uh, I'm Beth Riley. I'm the clinical director at the Brown Cancer Center, and it's my pleasure to introduce um, someone who is a colleague and a friend, Dr. Monica Mondotti. So Dr. Mondotti uh, did her medical training at the Gandhi Medical College in India, and then she's a homegrown success story from then on out. She did her residency here at the University of Louisville, and then we are lucky enough to have her stay uh, and join our fellowship program. Monica and I have worked closely both clinically and uh, research world, and I was super excited when she decided to stay on and nonetheless join our breast cancer multidisciplinary team. Uh, in her uh, few years as a faculty member, she's already made her mark. Uh, she's director and initiator of the high-risk breast clinic, uh, which she's gonna talk about today. Monica? Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you all for having me here this morning. Um, let me just change this first. This presentation. Sorry. Um, well, so the topic that I'm going to talk about today is breast cancer genetics and um, identifying and managing the risks which are associated with the different um, genes which increase the susceptibility to breast cancer. I chose to uh, talk about this topic because of two reasons. One, like Dr. Riley mentioned, we have started the high-risk breast clinic at the Brown Cancer Center, and we're trying to uh, help these women who are at a somewhat higher risk for breast cancer than the average population. And the second reason is I do think this is an important topic for most internists and primary care physicians, fellows, and uh, residents, as well as students in this room, um, because there is growing patient awareness about the role of genetics um, in the cancer risk, and there are several questions that patients have when they come for their visits. So the objectives of my talk today uh, will be to just give you a general overview of genetic testing, uh, to understand the risk of breast cancer, which is associated with different mutations. I'm going to spend a lot of my time talking about the high penetrance genes, to be very specific, the BRCA1 and BRCA2. And I'll also talk a little bit about the moderate penetrance genes, which we are starting to learn more about um, since we've been uh, doing more of the panel testing. Uh, I will be discussing the management of the risks which are associated with these different genes, particularly screening, chemo prevention, and surgery. So, what are, so we know that breast cancer is still one of the most, it is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in women in the United States, and the estimated incidence for 2016 is close to 250,000 new cases. Um, most of this breast cancer is actually sporadic, uh, meaning there's no for one particular gene which can explain uh, the risk of breast cancer in, in these individuals. It's, it's thought to be because of genetic abnormalities, but it's not something which is inherited. Only about 5 to 10 percent of breast cancer is actually hereditary, meaning it's because of mutations in one uh, specific gene which explains the development of breast cancer in the woman, and this is inherited from their mother or father. And about 15 to 20 percent of the breast cancer uh, is, uh, you see some familial clustering. That is, you see um, that there are several family members who have breast cancer, but they, this, in, this doesn't really follow a particular pattern of inheritance like the hereditary breast cancer does. Um, so it's, it's kind of long been thought, and we knew for a long time, that women uh, who have family members with breast cancer 
are at a higher risk of developing breast cancer than the average population. For example, if you had a first degree relative with breast cancer, your risk of developing breast cancer is about twice that of the average population. If you have a mother and a sister with breast cancer, you're about threefold or higher risk of developing breast cancer. But it's, it, it was always thought that this is because of some sort of shared family influences or environmental influences, or it's polygenic in nature, meaning there are several abnormalities in different genes, which is probably causing an increased risk of breast cancer. But what happened in the 1970s was they started to observe these uh, large families, uh, which had multiple cases of early onset breast cancer. And uh, these were affected, and several generations were being affected by uh, breast cancer. And this provided some sort of evidence uh, to the fact that there were probably some inherited factors which were contributing to this familial risk of breast cancer. Um, so this is Mary Claire King. She's the one who in the 1990s uh, did a lot of epidemiological work and went on eventually to do the biological work. And um, she was the one who initially discovered BRCA1 and uh, assigned it to chromosome 17. And subsequently, Myriad Genetics was actually the one which sequenced BRCA1 and later on BRCA2 in 1994 and 1995. And since then, uh, we're now almost two decades out, and we've learned quite a bit about these two mutations and several other mutations which uh, increase the breast cancer risk. So uh, w this is just a pedigree of what hereditary breast cancer looks like. Uh, and like I said, most specifically, BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, if you look at the three generations, there are several family members who, uh, who are affected with ovarian and breast cancer. And what are some of the features of this hereditary breast cancer? These are autosomal dominant inheritance, meaning uh, each child has a 50% chance of uh, inheriting the gene from their parents. Uh, these are usually high penetrance genes, that is, their phenotypic expression is pretty high. They tend to manifest themselves in each generation. It's unlikely to see skipped generations. Um, there's early onset of breast cancer. So most of the breast cancer is actually postmenopausal, right, in average women, whereas uh, the hereditary breast cancer tends to be premenopausal, more so in the 30s and 40s. Um, and there's also a high rate of triple negative breast cancer. This is particularly true for BRCA1 mutation. Um, the triple negative breast cancer is actually the not mo most common type of breast cancer um, in sporadic breast cancer, but whereas in BRCA1, it actually contributes to more than 70% of the uh, breast cancer in this population. So how do we identify these women uh, who are at an increased risk of hereditary breast cancer? Um, the in, uh, there's two ways. One is the antecedent criteria, and the other one is a model-based probability. Uh, what we really use more and apply more, and it's easier, convenient in the clinic, is the antecedent criteria. So any individual who has a uh, history of breast cancer and who fits any of these criteria would be eligible for genetic testing, and most of the insurance companies lately have been covering genetic testing in these uh, women. Uh, if, if there is a known family history of a particular gene mutation, then that's someone who definitely needs to undergo testing. If there's a first and second degree uh, relative um, who has had breast cancer at a younger age, less than 50 years, if there's more than one primary breast cancer, if there's two or more relatives with pancreatic, prostate, and breast cancer, um, if there's history of ovarian cancer in the family, or their history of male breast cancer. Uh, these are all indications for genetic testing in that individual. Or uh, if, if the individual's been diagnosed at an early age, that is less than 50 years of age, and there's one relative with breast, prostate, or pancreatic cancer, um, if, if they have triple negative breast cancer at a young age, that's less than 60 years, uh, personal history of ovarian or male breast cancer, because ovarian cancer is not really that common. Um, it's only about 1% to 2% uh, in the general population. And male breast cancer actually occurs in less than 1% of the patients. So if someone's having male breast cancer, that's an indication for testing. Uh, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry and with a family history of breast or ovarian cancer is an indication for testing. Um, that's because the frequency of BRCA1 and BRCA2 in this particular population is much higher than uh, the others. It's about 1 in 40. And if if, there is no, if, the, if there's no personal history of breast cancer, but there's a family history which meets any of these above criteria, the individuals would still be eligible for uh, testing. However, it's important that we uh, discuss the limitations with this individual. Um, we really want to uh, target and test the person who is affected with breast cancer. And if 
they, there is a family member of this individual who uh, is around and whom we can test and who has cancer. That's whom we want to test first. We really don't want to be testing someone who is not unaffected if possible. Um, and if there's a combination of cancers in an individual, which is suggestive of hereditary cancer syndrome, uh, these, uh, these individuals would be eligible for testing. And the hereditary cancer syndromes are some of the syndromes which happen because of mutations in uh, other high penetrance genes, such as PP53, P10, uh, STK11, and which I'll be discussing down the line. So what's the ideal approach for genetic testing, right? You see a patient, you feel like, okay, she fits the NCCM criteria, and she might qualify for genetic testing. Uh, it, I, the ideal approach is really you want to send her to a genetic counselor. And, and the reason being, the genetic counselors do a very good job at taking a good personal history and a good family history there's multiple testing options available, so they really want to get that information to decide what is the best test for this patient. Um, and for example, there was, uh, there was a lady who I saw in my clinic who um, had a BRCA1 mutation and who had breast cancer. Uh, she, she underwent testing with a panel which only had breast cancer susceptibility genes, but when I was talking to her, I realized that there's a strong family history of colon cancer. And had she seen a genetic counselor, probably the colon cancer susceptibility genes would have been included in that panel. So that's how you know, going to a genetic counselor does make a difference in um, how they're going to test these individuals. Um, genetic testing is either done or on blood or saliva, so a fairly straightforward test. Um, Post-test counseling is also important, where the patient meets with the genetic counselor or discusses with the genetic counselor about what, what the results really mean. If they end up with a positive result, what does this mean? What is their risk of different cancers with this particular uh, mutation? However, if they end up with a negative result, that's also important because what does the negative result mean in the setting of a strong family history? Does this mean that the patient does not have any risk of breast cancer? That's not true. She would still have some degree of uh, breast cancer risk and what those risks are, these are all the sort of things the genetic counselor helps patients un uh, understand. Subsequently, they'll be referred to uh, the appropriate specialist. Um, it could, depending on what their needs are, to a medical oncologist, to a surgical oncologist, and to a gynecological oncologist um, to discuss about risk reduction strategies in this population. So um, the, the BRCA, so I'm going to talk about BRCA testing uh, because, you know, we've, we've known uh, about BRCA for a long time now, and there's been some changes in the BRCA testing since we've discovered these genes. Initially, we used to look for uh, the protein truncating mutations, um, and we used to look for the specific mutations. We did a fair job with that, but there were about 10% of the BRCA uh, positive individuals who were not being picked up by this sort of testing, and that's because there were uh, some large deletions and duplications which were happening, uh, were, were responsible for uh, the increased risk of breast cancer in this particular BRCA uh, positive uh, population. And uh, once that was realized, um, the, the, the testing started including what's called the BART testing, that is BRCA um, analysis and rearrangement testing. And since 2011, when we do order BRCA testing, this is, a, uh, this is an integral part of BRCA testing. So, uh, that, that was a big change, and now we're in the era of next generation sequencing, which allows us to uh, simultaneously analyze multiple genes together. And, and since 2013, um, when the Supreme Court ruled against the patenting of uh, genomic DNA sequence of BRCA1 and BRCA2 by Myriad Genetics, there's really been sort of an explosion of all these panel tests which started to incorporate BRCA1 and 2 into these panels, and these, these have been offered to women where we're testing not only uh, the BRCA1 and 2, but we're also testing a, a lot of other genes where, where the penetrance of these genes may be not the same as BRCA1 and 2. Um, so these are all the different multiplex sequencing panels, um, and these panels can analyze anywhere from five genes to 100 cancer-implicated genes at the same time. Um, and, and like I mentioned, they Im include not only the high penetrance, but they also include the moderate and low penetrance genes. So there are definite advantages uh, to, to doing these panels, but there are also certain disadvantages. The advantages are that they allow for testing multiple genes at the same time for about the same cost that we used to um, use uh, to spend 
uh, on just testing two genes in the past. So genetic testing has really, uh, the price has decreased significantly in the past. It used to be anywhere from $4,000 to $5,000 just to look at BRCA, but now it's well under $2,000. Uh, so that's been an advantage. Um, there's short turnaround times of just three to four weeks. There's definitely improved diagnostic yield in the sense, yes, you're learning about um, the really important mutations, BRCA1 and 2, but you're also learning about the other mutations and you're trying to understand how these other mutations are uh, in, influence the risk of uh, breast cancer in these women. Uh, there's improved insight into the level of cancer risk. There's also definite disadvantages which uh, come with, you know, sort of testing for these multiple genes. Uh, we are not quite sure if we have a complete understanding of how these, um, what the risks of all of these genes are at this time. We're trying to understand, but we're not quite there yet. So there are questions of clinical validity. And there's also questions of clinical utility, meaning, you know, yes, they have these mutations, and we know that there's probably a somewhat increased risk, but what are we going to do about this? Are we going to do, are we going to offer um, a mastectomy to all these women? Are we going to offer chemo prevention? So we quite don't know exactly what to do with all the other genes. We have some data on BRCA1 and 2, but not so much on the other genes. Um, there's also high frequency of variants of unknown significance. Now, where, what are variants of unknown significance? These are uh, genetic alterations, which are frequently missense mutations, uh, whose disease association is unknown, and there's uncertainty, uncertainty about the management of uh, such patients. Um, so this, this is a nice uh, picture here, which uh, really puts together all the different breast cancer susceptibility genes that are included in the panel. Uh, the y-axis gives us the relative risk of uh, developing breast cancer, and the x-axis gives us the minor allele frequency in the population. And if you look at the top end of the curve, uh, these are all the high penetrance genes, which are not very common, uh, as you see in the general population. And here we have the BRCA1 and BRCA2, the TP53C, P10, CDH1, and STK11. In the middle, um, you have what we call the moderate penetrance genes. And these are ATM, PALB2, CHECK2, and BRP1. And the relative risk, which is associated with these moderate penetrance genes, is anywhere from two to four. For the high penetrance genes, it's usually pretty high. It's always greater than five, and it's usually uh, uh, close to a 10. Um, and down at the bottom of the curve, you have all these genes, which are actually quite frequent in the population, about 30% of the time. Uh, you're seeing the, uh, about 30%. However, uh, we really don't know what the presence of all these genes means at this time. And if you look at the relative risk, it's only slightly higher than the average population. Um, so I, right now, we don't really act any differently if we uh, see these genes, but I think the big question is how well, you know, what, what difference, um, how is it going to be different if we have a, a, a higher um, penetrance mutation such as BRCA1 and BRCA2, and we also have these uh, lower penetrance mutations in the same individual. How are they going to alter the risks of some of these higher penetrance mutations? I think that's uh, an important question, and we're really uh, looking at that at this time. Um, so what are all these genes which are known to increase the risk of breast cancers? Where are they? What is the function of these genes? So most of these genes, as you can see, are involved in the DNA repair process. Um, uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are really uh, involved in the homologous recombination repair when there is a uh, double-stranded DNA break. And as you can see, all the other genes, such as ATM, uh, CHECK2, PALB2, they're interacting with BRCA1 and BRCA2 in facilitating the same process. So so it makes sense, right, that all these genes are sort of associated with an increased risk of uh, breast cancer. All right, so we, we saw that there are certain genes which are associated with increased risk. So why do we have to test for these genes? What are we going to do different about finding out that uh, a particular woman uh, has an increased risk? Well, so it may help with our treatment decisions in a newly diagnosed breast cancer patient. And how is that? So if you have a breast cancer patient who has an early stage uh, breast cancer, what we try to do is do breast conservation surgery and, uh, and, and do a lumpectomy and spare her breast. However, if you know that this patient has a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation, you may not want to do that. You may want to discuss with the patient the role of a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy. So that's how it's going to influence your decision of what kind of surgery you're going to do on that particular patient. Um, right now, where we stand, chemotherapy decisions are truly not uh, entirely, um, you know, different uh, in this population. However, there's um, 
growing interest in targeted therapy and looking at different chemotherapy drugs and seeing if uh, they are more uh, active in this subset of patients um, than the average um, patients. And they also help with risk assessment of other family members. That is, if you know that there's a woman with BRCA mutation positive, you're definitely going to test the other family members and see if she's at an increased risk. Uh, it does help if it's true negative, right? Uh, if you test a family member and comes out that they don't have a BRCA mutation, uh, that, that definitely gives peace of mind to that patient. And they definitely help with prevention in the unaffected carriers. So what are the different ways you manage these patients? Um, first and foremost, and the most important thing, I, uh, thing is uh, to give the patient an individualized risk assessment about what their risks are of developing breast cancer. Uh, of course, we're going to uh, discuss screening with them, and the screening recommendations are a little different for this population than for the average risk women. Um, surgery, that is bilateral uh, prophylactic mastectomy, and also um, salpingo oophorectomy because the BRCA1 and 2 uh, mutation carriers that are at an increased risk of ovarian cancer as well, and chemo prevention. So I'm going to talk uh, about the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations first. These are large tumor suppressor genes which uh, are involved in DNA repair. BRCA1 is located on chromosome 17, and BRCA2 is located on chromosome 13. Uh, the prevalence of the pathogenic mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2 are 1 in 300 and 1 in 800, respectively. And there's certain founder mutations in Ashkenazi Jews and some other populations. Particularly, there's three different founder mutations in Ashkenazi Jews, where it's, uh, two of them in BRCA1 and one in BRCA2. And when you start to test this population, you actually start to test with these mutations. And if they're negative, you tend to go on and do the other testing. So what are the cancer risks with these genes? Um, as you see, there's a, there's a lot of different cancers which are, uh, which are associated with these genes. Uh, breast cancer, of course, is uh, the, the risk is the highest in BRCA1, where the range is from 50 to 80 percent. BRCA2, it's 40 to 70 percent. Uh, there's also an increased risk of second breast cancer. There's increased risk of ovarian cancer, more so in BRCA1, but also in BRCA2. Male breast cancer, prostate cancer, and pancreatic cancer uh, is more common in BRCA2 than BRCA1. If you look at the risks, particularly uh, if you look at the risk of breast cancer, you see that there's a broad range. And why do we see such a broad range? Why can't we just say, okay, your risk is like maybe 55 to 60 percent, or it's 40 to 45 percent? And the reason, there are several different reasons. One is it depends on what kind of study you're looking at. Um, so when they, if you look at studies which have been performed on um, different families which have a BRCA1 mutation or BRCA2 mutation, when you calculate the risk from these families, obviously the risk is going to be higher. And, um, and if you uh, calculate the risk out of population-based studies, the risk is going to be lower. So really it depends upon what kind of sample you're looking at, and that's the ascertainment bias. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the table here on the... Uh, for BRCA1, the population-based study, which was performed by Chen et al., the, the average risk, uh, the lifetime estimate of risk was noted to be 46 percent, as opposed to 85 percent when you looked at a population-based study, which was uh, performed by Easton et al. And same goes for BRCA2, uh, where uh, the, the family-based study's risk was 43 percent, and the population-based study, sorry, the population-based uh, uh, study's risk was 43 percent, and family-based study risk was about 80 percent. Uh, there's definitely um, more reasons to this variation in risk, and this is because of genetic and non-genetic uh, modifiers of risk. So there's been a lot uh, learned about the genetic modifiers of risk uh, because of these large consortia which tend to collect data on the G BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation carriers and, and uh, different studies which have been done by these large consortia. And one such study was recently published in JAMA in 2015, uh, which was an observational study of close to 20,000 BRCA1 mutation carriers and 12,000 BRCA2 mutation carriers. And this was um, across the continent. And what they noticed was certain mutations which were um, clustered in, in the middle portion of the gene were associated with a higher risk of ovarian cancer as opposed to the mutations which were kind of on the either end of the gene were associated with a higher risk of breast cancer. Um, so what this tells us is definitely there's genotype and phenotypic uh, associations, right? So different types of mutations are associated with different types of risk. Um, there's also, uh, the risks are also altered by um, single nucleotide polymorphisms, 
which have been um, identified in genome-wide association studies, which have been done by these consortia. And what, the, what they're trying to do now is to give us what's called a polygenic risk score, where they try to give us a score which sort of tells us how the presence of these SNPs is altering the risk of these mutations. You know, we're not using this in clinic quite yet, but I think that's where the field is headed. And eventually, we might be able to give the woman a more specific number than giving her a whole range of, oh, your risk is anywhere from 40 to 80 or 85 percent, which is pretty confusing for the woman. Um, there's also non-genetic modifiers of risk, and this is, this is something which, which we've always been interested in because we feel like we have some sort of control on these, right? We feel like, oh, maybe we, if we alter something here, we might be able to change the risk. Um, the data here, unfortunately, has not been very reproducible in most of the studies. Um, there was a meta-analysis which was published by Tara Friebel's group in JNCI in 2013 where they looked at all the same factors which we know that they influence the breast cancer risk in general population. Um, they looked at the age of first uh, ch uh, live childbirth and um, there was some uh, effect on the BRCA1 population but not so much on BRCA2. Uh, the the uh, age of first ch uh, live childbirth greater than 30 was thought to be uh, somewhat protective for BRCA1. Same with breastfeeding. There was some decrease in risk for breastfeeding. Uh, age of menarche. Uh, thought was a little protective in BRCA1, uh, that's later ages of menarche. Three or more uh, live births uh, versus nulliparity uh, was protective in both BRCA1 and BRCA2. Use of oral contraceptive pills ever versus never. Um, this, was, um, this increased the risk of breast cancer both in BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, tamoxifen and contralateral breast cancer risk, there was a protective effect, effect uh, in uh, preventing contralateral breast cancer. Smoking, there were inconsistent results in BRCA1, and it was worse for women with BRCA2. Mammography, there was no effect. So ultimately, we're left with this difficult task of counseling these women with what their risks are, right? And where do we stand with that now? This still continues to be a challenging task. There's genome-wide association studies which are being performed, and hopefully we can use the polygenic risk scores. The BRCA uh, cancer risk management decision tools, there are several different tools which are available. However, these tools are really built on assumptions, and uh, there's no randomized data yet to support these models. Uh, so the risk estimates may or may not be accurate at this time. And ultimately, the decision of screening versus surgery in this population Unfortunately, it depends a lot on the degree of anxiety of the patient, um, although this, this is not the ideal approach, but, you know, we see this happening a lot in the clinic. So what are the other high penetrance genes besides BRCA1 and um, BRCA2? Um, there's the TP53 gene mutations, which uh, cause Lifromeni syndrome. And there is a high uh, relative risk of breast cancer in this population. And uh, this is responsible for really early onset breast cancer in women less than 30 years of age. There's other cancers which are associated with this syndrome, such as childhood sarcoma, adenocortical carcinoma, brain tumors. And where, when you're seeing uh, an individual with all these different kinds of cancers, this is something which comes, should come to your mind. There's also mutations in P10, which cause Cowden syndrome, and uh, these individuals, in addition to breast cancer risk, also have thyroid, endometrial, and brain cancer risk. Uh, CDH1 mutations call, uh, her cause hereditary diffuse gastric cancer syndrome, and um, these women uh, particularly tend to have lobular breast cancer, uh, whereas the most common type of breast cancer is actually uh, invasive ductal carcinoma. Uh, STK11 um, mutations cause Peutz-Jäger syndrome, which increase the risk of colon, pancreatic, and ovarian sex caused stromal tumors. So what are the screening recommendations for the women who have BRCA1 and BRCA2 and other high-risk uh, mutations? Uh, the NCCN recommends uh, starting breast awareness um, with a monthly self-breast exam starting at the age of 18. A semi-annual breast exam is recommended starting at the age of 25 by a physician. Um, an annual MRI between the ages of 25 to 29. And uh, MRI and mammogram annually between the ages of 30 to 75. And after 75, they recommend individualizing management, uh, discussing with the patient as to uh, what the risks and benefits are. So how well have we done by altering the screening recommendations by adding an MRI to an annual mammogram in this high-risk population? 
So there was a study which was published in JCO done by Warner et al's group uh, where they looked at a set of women who were getting just annual mammograms, another set of women who were getting uh, annual mammograms and MRIs and they followed them for a little over three years and what they noticed is that there was a definite phase shift in the women who were getting MRIs. Um, although the overall incidence of cancers uh, detected in both groups was about the same, maybe a little bit higher in the group which was getting MRI, so it was certainly not over diagnosis, but there was particularly a state shift where you're seeing that uh, women who were getting the MRIs, um, the yellow line is the MRI group and the blue line is the ones who are getting mammograms only. Uh, the, the, so on the left you see that the stage two to four uh, breast cancers were lower in the MRI group, whereas uh, the, the stage zero and stage one breast cancers were uh, higher in the group which were getting MRIs and mammograms and lower in the group which were um, getting mammograms only. So this, uh, so the, the stage shift definitely helps, right? Because we know that diagnosing cancer at the advanced stage um, uh, obviously leads to a worse prognosis and this gives us an opportunity to, for early detection and treatment. Um, particularly for BRCA1 mutation carriers where they have a very high risk of triple negative breast cancer, this can certainly be important. So what could we do differently in terms of screening? So there's been some evidence, um, actually very, a very small study which uh, suggested that Q6 monthly MRI might be better than doing an annual MRI. But MRIs are expensive and insurances may not want to pay for a Q6 monthly MRI and I don't think we're ready for that yet from a payer standpoint. There's also, at this time, we also don't know what the impact of tomosynthesis and mammograms are. We're using that a lot, and really all these studies which have been done were before tomosynthesis has been used a lot. So we don't know how it compares to including in, it, it into the picture, you know, how it compares to doing an annual MRI with, with tomosynthesis or just tomosynthesis alone. Um, the data on the age at which mammograms should be initiated is somewhat debatable. Uh, so there were some studies which showed that mammograms really did not add much to an MRI uh, in, in the BRCA1 mutation carriers in women who were uh, younger than 40 years of age. And this could be because of the breast density, and we know that mammograms are not always great in young women. So we really don't know. And there's also been some suggestion that exposure to radiation uh, may not be the best thing in these women who, ha who have had, DN who are susceptible to DNA damage, but so far there's no proven, like the evidence has never been strong enough to say they've been bad. Um, so we don't know what we're gaining by adding uh, mammograms in addition to MRI in these um, BRCA1 positive women. And, and this, the final question is, should the screening recommendations be different for BRCA1 and BRCA2? So there was a meta-analysis of three studies which showed that there was a higher rate of intervel cancers in BRCA1, which is about 5%, compared to BRCA2, it was 1.5%, sorry, 1.7%. And this is probably because of the difference in the, nat um, the natural history of the cancers in these both uh, groups. BRCA1s uh, tend to have more than 70% of these are triple negative breast cancers, whereas BRCA2 have a higher rate of hormone receptor positive cancers. Um, uh, so both of these obviously differ in the way they behave. Uh, BRCA1, uh, the triple negative breast cancers tend to be more aggressive and, uh, and, and maybe they're presenting more as interval cancers as opposed to those uh, in the BRCA2 subgroup. <clears throat> now let's look at the evidence on bilateral prophylactic mastectomy in uh, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 population. So uh, this, this was a study uh, which tells us that bilateral prophylactic mastectomy was pretty good at preventing breast cancer uh, uh, by more than 90% in women uh, who had intact ovaries, and it decreases the risk of breast cancer by more than 95% in women who've had a salpingo oophorectomy. So we're, we're very successful in preventing breast cancers uh, by doing a bilateral prophylactic uh, mastectomy in this population. However, what the, the important question would be is, you know, how, um, how does it compare to surveillance, right? Uh, when you compare bilateral prophylactic mastectomy and when you compare surveillance, uh, is, uh, you know, how does it compare? Obviously, there's going to be a higher number of breast cancers diagnosed in the individuals who are uh, going to undergo surveillance because we're not doing anything to prevent the development of breast cancer, whereas with the bilateral prophylactic mastectomy, we are doing something to prevent the breast cancer. But the big question is, is there a difference in mortality? Is there a difference in survival? So there was an uh, absolute mortality difference about 3% based on kaplan meier estimates in the group which um, underwent surveillance compared to the group which uh, underwent a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy. However, this was not statistically significant. So you are, 
really not achieving anything in terms of survival, but, but you are preventing breast cancer development. Uh, so what about the quality of life in these women who undergo a prophylactic mastectomy? So there, there were quite a few studies done looking at this. Um, and, and one of the studies which was published in JCO, they actually gave out questionnaires to about 98 women uh, at three different time points uh, before the bilateral prophylactic mastectomy, six months after and one year after. And what they noticed was there was no real difference in uh, sexuality. About 50% reported problems with body image. Anxiety decreased over time. Makes sense, right? They're worried about, oh, am I going to develop breast cancer? It's obviously going to decrease with a pretty effective modality which prevents the development of breast cancer. And there's no difference in mean health-related quality of life. And there was another similar study which showed that women did overall fairly OK on, on most of these as aspects, except for somatosensory function, which was what was the worst scored uh, in the survey. So, so really, uh, overall, no big difference in the quality of life, at least based on these surveys. But uh, one thing I want to point out is we most, I don't know what, how many of these women did undergo a salpingo oophorectomy, which does have a fairly significant impact on quality of life, which is also offered to these women who have uh, BRCA1 and 2. So uh, salpingo oophorectomy is recommended for all the women who have BRCA1 and 2 mutation carrier uh, uh, mutations after completion of childbearing. Uh, in BRCA1, it's offered between 35 to 40 years, and it's reasonable to delay until 40 to 45 years for BRCA2 mutation carriers. Uh, there's a 90% reduction in risk of ovarian and fallopian tube cancer and 77% decrease in all-cause mortality. And uh, the salping oophorectomy decreases breast cancer risk by 50%, and this is thought to be because of a decreased hormonal exposure. So um, what, what's the impact of salping oophorectomy on breast cancer? So this was a, a study which was uh, performed by Noah Kauf, published in JCO in 2008, um, and where they looked at these women uh, who underwent salping oophorectomy, and they noticed that when you looked at the BRCA1 and 2 population combined, there was a, a decreased risk of uh, breast cancer in this population, but the, the, there was a beneficial effect in BRCA1, but this did not reach statistical significance. For the BRCA2, definitely there was a beneficial effect. And again, this goes to speak, is this because BRCA1s have more triple negative and BRCA2s have more hormone receptor positive breast cancer? And is that why we're seeing these difference? So what about the role of chemo prevention in this population? So over the years, there's, there's been different chemo preventative agents which have been looked at, um, such as tamoxifen, ignistane, and anastrozole. And there have been several large prevention studies. Uh, which have been performed, and we know that these are fairly effective in women who are at a higher than average risk of developing breast cancer, and the women who were included in these trials were mostly postmenopausal women, those women who had a high, high Gale score, um, those who had uh, benign breast lesions, which uh, suggest an increased risk of breast cancer, such as atypical ductal hyperplasia or lobular carcinoma in situ, and, and the, the risk reduction was anywhere from uh, 40 to 60 percent. Um, so are these agents really good in preventing breast cancer in BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation carriers. So really, the evidence is sort of sparse in this area. Um, this was a subset of patients. This was a study which was published by King and JAMA in 2001. Um, and, and really, the study, if you see, the numbers are so small, right? What they did was they looked at all, they took the patients from the P1 study, all the women who developed breast cancers. And they did uh, genomic analysis on these women, and they identified 19 women who had BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. And they looked at the women who took tamoxifen and compared them to who did not take tamoxifen. And they saw that uh, the tamoxifen was beneficial in BRCA2 mutation carriers, but not in BRCA1 mutation carriers. But I wouldn't read too much into these results, because it's such a small study. We're literally talking about eight patients. So I don't know if I can convince uh, patients with the small study that chemo prevention is effective. Um, there's some indirect evidence, though, that tamoxifen might be beneficial in this population. And this comes from looking at the risk of contralateral breast cancer in women who have had a unilateral breast cancer and they took tamoxifen after, as a part of treatment of the breast cancer. So this study, there were close to 2,500 uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation carriers um, whose uh, ER status was actually not known in, a, in well over 50% of these patients. Um, and 17% and, um, of the ER-negative patients also got tamoxifen, and I'm not entirely sure why. 
And tamoxifen, uh, so what they did notice, though, is that tamoxifen use was associated with a decrease uh, in breast, contralateral breast cancers, both in BRCA1 as well as BRCA2 mutation carriers. Um, however, you know, this, this, the, the decrease in the breast, contralateral breast cancer was seen more in the women who were older, postmenopausal, um, who had more ER positive disease, uh, uh, and those who underwent a bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy. And we know that um, bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy has some protective effect on breast cancer. These are all sort of confounding factors, and we really don't know what the degree of effect of tamoxifen itself was in preventing contralateral breast cancers in this study. There's also some adverse effects which come with chemopreventative agents, right, uh, such as hot flashes, mood changes, increased vaginal secretions, thrombotic events, endometrial carcinoma. Although the thrombotic events and endometrial carcinoma is what scares uh, patients the most, the incidence of these uh, adverse effects is not that high. When we do recommend chemoprevention for, gero, uh, uh, for other women who are at high risk, um, we do believe that the benefits of chemoprevention outweigh the risks, and that's why we recommend. And, and the, the, the thrombotic events are honestly 1% or less, and endometrial carcinoma is not seriously a problem in the young patients who are less than 50 years of age. It's usually a problem in the older patients. Sexual dysfunction is a problem which women complain about, uh, bone health, particularly with aromatase inhibitors and cataracts. So when we're discussing chemoprevention uh, in, in uh, women with, in women who have BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers, are, it's, it's sort of a hard task to convince these women to, to, do, uh, to do these agents because, you know, the data is sort of sparse and there's all these side effects and you have to really balance uh, and say, okay, you know, this is really going to benefit you. So the acceptance rate, honestly, is not very high. Um, so where do we stand with chemoprevention? There's no prospective randomized control trials, and I don't see that happening because it's not ethical to do that in this population, I would say. Uh, evidence comes from retrospective analysis and efficacy of tamoxifen on, uh, on prevention of contralateral breast cancer. Um, and the benefit on BRC, uh, in BRCA1 uh, carriers is debatable. So do we do anything different uh, in treating these uh, patients who do develop breast cancers? Uh, in terms of chemotherapy, there are some target agents, um, particularly PARP inhibitors, which have been looked at. And they follow the concept of synthetase lethality, which refers to when there's two or more genetic, le genetic lesions, um, which are individually by themselves not lethal, uh, they may become lethal and cause the cell to die. And the PARP inhibitors have actually been FDA approved for use in ovarian cancer at this time, but they've not been approved for use in breast cancer. But there are several studies being performed in the metastatic setting and the adjuvant setting, and maybe down the line we're going to uh, look at PARP inhibitors being a part of treatment for breast cancers in these women. So uh, quickly, uh, uh, let's talk about the moderate penetrance genes. So there's several of these moderate, moderate penetrance genes, uh, which we are starting to learn about only since 2013, actually. You know, these genes have been known for a long time, since the early 2000s, but we didn't know a whole lot about them because we weren't doing panels back then. But now that we do more panels, there's more women who are being diagnosed with this, and we're trying to understand these genes better. And the most important among these, I think, is the PALB2, where the risk of breast cancer is actually much higher compared to the other um, moderate penetrance genes. And the, if you see, the re relative risk of developing breast cancer is fivefold. Uh, and the, although the confidence interval is somewhat broad, and there's also thought to be a mildly increased risk of pancreatic cancer in these individuals. However, the percentage of risk is not still well known. Uh, the other genes are CHECK2, ATM, NBN, and NF1. All of these have a relative risk uh, somewhere between 2 and 3, and they're all associated with different cancer types, uh, like CHECK2. Uh, if there's a strong family history of colon cancer, uh, we, you know, we do offer uh, screen, earlier screening for colon cancer in individuals with CHECK2, ATM, NBN, and NF1 with pancreatic cancer and other, other tumors. So how, how often, how, what's the frequency of these other germline mutations in the population? Uh, so Nadine Chung's group actually did an analysis where they, uh, where they looked at close to 500 patients and they did panel, um, and, and they did panel testing on all these 500 unselected stage 1 to 3 breast cancer patients and they saw that the frequency of BRCA1 and BRCA2 was about 6% in this uh, population and the, uh, the other genetic mutations which are the moderate penetrance genes was about 4%. 
Um, the interesting observation which was made by um, this group in the study was that the NCCM criteria was doing a great job identifying all these women who, were, who tested positive for BRCA1 and BRCA2, and all of these women were actually referred for genetic testing, uh, whereas the, the NCCM criteria were not really picking up on these moderate penetrance genes, and that's probably because what they noticed was the, the breast cancers and in individuals who uh, had this moderate penetrance genes were actually occurring in, a, in the later uh, age, like more in the postmenopausal age. And these were mostly ER positive breast cancers. So these are not some of the characteristics of people with BRCA1 and BRCA2. And the NCCM criteria were actually designed to capture all the individuals who are BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers. So it explains that they're not really able to capture these women with um, um, the moderate penetrance genes. Now, the real problem that I see in counseling women who have the genes of moderate penetrance is uh, calculating their absolute risk. And that's because there's different things with into, which influence the absolute risk of breast cancer in these women. The relative risk of breast cancer actually changes with uh, age in some of these mutations. And there's a strong influence of family history of breast cancer, particularly for uh, uh, PALB2. And some of these genes have variable penetrance, and all of these things affect uh, the absolute amount of risk that they have for breast cancer. So PALB2 as an example, if you look at, at different ages, they have different relative risks, and uh, different family history confers a different uh, degree of risk for breast cancer in this population. In individuals who do not have a family history, um, their lifetime risk of developing breast, can breast cancer is 33%. And individuals who have first or second degree relative with breast cancer, their uh, lifetime risk is more in the 50s, so you see how broad the risks are. Um, and and PALB2 also has a real uh, broad confidence interval. And uh, if you look at this graph, the, the bold red line is sort of an average risk that you get, and the dashed red lines are the, uh, the either limits of confidence interval. And depending on where the woman falls from the top to the bottom, her risk is going to be very different. So if she falls at the top end, her risk may be more, you know, sixfold or sevenfold, which puts her close to BRCA2. So she might be someone who would be justified getting a mastectomy. Um, uh, or, and, and if her risk, if she falls in the lower end of the curve, she might, you know, she may not need such aggressive interventions. So ultimately, we manage the risks in these patients uh, so in a somewhat similar way that we do with BRCA1 and BRCA2. However, um, the, the surveillance recommendations are uh, somewhat similar, but surgery really, there's no threshold where we can recommend bilat uh, bilateral prophylactic mastectomy. Uh, one way I would look at it is the risks which uh, come with these moderate penetrance genes are somewhat close to the benign um, breast lesions, which put people at increased risk for breast cancer, such as ADH and LCIS, and we don't routinely recommend mastectomy in this population. So. I, I do not see myself re recommending a mastectomy in uh, women with moderate penetrance genes unless they have a very strong family history that suggests that maybe they're at a higher risk. And chemo prevention, we really do not have any data. I'm going to skip this slide. Um, and, and just to uh, conclude, um, we, the interpretation of the test results is becoming complicated with comprehensive testing. Uh, appropriate risk assessment and counseling will help patients with decision making and relieve anxiety and more information on the risks associated with different genes may be available in the future, and participation in re registries is very important for the progressive research in the area. And there's several of those re registries. Uh, Prompt is one of the examples of those. And, and that's all I have. Uh, uh, I want to thank you all for your time and attention, and I want to thank Dr. Riley, Dr. Miller, and Dr. Roman for giving me this opportunity to speak, and also the breast cancer uh, team for helping me out. Tell me again, uh, as we saw for low dose CT, we have a very clear criteria of who to screen mm -hmm. and who to not screen. Mm -hmm. Give me those criteria again for breast cancer. Well, that's a tough question, right? Because there's different, <laughs> there's different uh, societies recommending different things for screening at this time. The US Preventive uh, Task, Force rec Task Force recommends starting screening for average risk women at 50 years or older, the American Cancer Society starts at a little earlier age at 45. 
and the ACR, I think, is even earlier at 40. Um, obviously, I just spoke a lot about the high-risk women, and these uh, women start screening at a much earlier age with MRIs between 25 to 29, and from 20, 30 on, both MRIs and mammograms. So what do I tell my wife and my two daughters and my dog get? So I'm going to tell, uh, you know, you really want to start discussing the role of mammogram with your primary care physician once you start 40. And my decision whether or not to move forward with the mammogram will depend on what kind of family history the individual has and if she's willing to accept that, you know, starting at age 40, yes, you're definitely at a higher risk for breast cancer than you were when you were in your 30s, but there may be some false positives, so are you willing to undergo more biopsies? That's a discussion you want to have with your patient because that it's, it's ultimate, it ultimately bottoms down to what the patient wants. Is she more worried about, oh, am I going to develop breast cancer, and, 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 or is she more worried about, oh, I don't want to undergo all these extra interventions because that's what we're trying to prevent, right? Um, and the recommendations have changed mainly for that reason, not because mammograms are not beneficial. It's mainly because we're identifying some more false positives. Yeah. The other thing I was going to mention is that when I think about saving and, and making decisions about mastectomy or whatever, I think about Angelina Jolie. Oh, yeah, 2013. And I sort of lean toward Angelina. <laughs> now, Angelina has all the resources in the world to find the best experts and get all the saving you want. How does this kind of personalized medicine need to see influencing health disparities? That's a tough one. That is a tough one. <laughs> um, sorry, it just come, I didn't get the question, I think. Uh, I, I probably want that repeated. So if some people are worried, clearly we should screen as many as we could. We want to save lives. Mm -hmm. But some people do not have access to screening, period. We see that in Kentucky. And so over generations, you will actually accentuate health disparities. Mm -hmm. Do you think that may happen in breast cancer? Or do we have much more awareness of breast cancer so people have much more better access to, to this kind of well, intervention? So I think celebrities like Angelina Jolie coming out and talking about breast cancer certainly helps uh, educating people about what the breast cancer risks are and what screening means and everything. And I think uh, with the, the change in the health policies with more affordable health care, which happened in the past, um, that definitely gives access to health care. And so part of the problem might be because people may not have been able to afford the kind of care they've needed. And if that goes down, maybe there's a higher chance that people will be able to get screened. And education plays a huge role as to physicians like us uh, going out into the community and educating patients or, you know, primary care physicians, educating their patients about what the role of mammograms is and how it would help them. All these sort of things I think will help in terms of disparities in the long run. Thank you. Questions or comments? Pat? That's a great question. I don't think we have any evidence to say this is when we have to start uh, doing chemo prevention. But if the woman, you know, most of the time in my own practice, I've seen women mostly in like the 30s or 40s. And at that age, we can very much offer chemo prevention because that's what the P1 trials did. Anyone who was greater than 35, they did offer tamoxifen, and that's, uh, that's appropriate. So I, in, in my own practice, I think I tend to offer them at the first encounter when I meet them, and I discuss, hey, these are the risks. What do you want to do? Do you want to undergo a mastectomy? Do you want to undergo escalated surveillance with chemo prevention? That's when I do. Now the question comes, okay, we're doing chemo prevention for five years then. What about the rest of their lifetime risks, right? I really don't have a great answer to that, to be quite honest. Yeah, but, and I think doctors struggle with this, that we, we want to give the patient the opportunity to make decisions. But, you know, as a patient, when I take my car to the mechanic, I say, I don't want three options. You, you're the mechanic. I'm paying. Tell me what you want. And it's cheap. Uh, and so when we, some people come to doctors wanting options, but at the same time, they tell me, well, what would you do, Dr. Rowe? And you're left with that uncertainty. Uh, and ultimately, you're going to have to make a decision of what to do. Because yeah. they need that. So that's an interesting. Any other comments or thoughts, questions? If not, thank you. Enjoy your Thursday. Can you, Amanda, can you stay behind? Amanda, can you stay behind?